The BlackRock's infidelities actually validated the investment case for pension funds. And these guys, they may validate it for like sovereign wealth funds. As a result, these guys, the sovereign wealth funds, they start validating it for central bank. There's been huge price appreciations post halving on average 17x, 500 days after the halving. And there's a time lag of this effect, which takes hold around 100 days after halving and then becomes increasingly significant. And so 100 days after the halving would imply so we had the halving event on the 20th of april this would imply that it will become significant around august banks create money out of thin air every time a commercial bank lends money it creates money the marginal cost of production in order to produce a single euro is the same for like 1 billion euro it used to be a career risk to invest into bitcoin but at some point this will change so it will be a career risk not to invest since trading launch us spot Bitcoin ETFs alone, we saw around 14.5 billion, almost 15 billion in net flows only. It blew out expectations. You haven't probably even seen half of potential inflows. And it's not like adoption drives price. It's the other way around. Price drives adoption. Let's start with the basics. Like what is market liquidity for those who don't know? I think uh, market liquidity and sometimes also referred to as macro liquidity. It's, yeah, it's, it's right. I mean, many people understand many different things, right? And when you speak about macro liquidity, for instance, I think most people understand money supply growth, right? Of course, you have def different definitions of money supply growth. Right, you have maybe central bank base money money growth, central bank reserves. You have M1, M2, and so on. You have credit growth, which some people also understand as like uh, money supply growth in general. But I think what most people tend to look at in terms of liquidity growth are central bank reserves, and sometimes also M2 money supply growth. But I think that's like the liquid component of money supply that most people pay attention to. And um, so as far as money supply growth is concerned, there was like in April, uh, the M2 money supply, monetary aggregate in the US turned positive for the first time since I think mid 2022. And it has been contracting since mid 2022. It has been contracting for almost two years, right? And as far as I know, it's been the longest contraction in money supply slash liquidity um, since the 1930s. And I think it's, it's, it's totally consistent with the fact that um, we have an invent inverted yield curve, right? The term structure of interest rates in US treasury markets has not been upward sloping, but has been like inverted. So the longer end of the yield curve has been lower, the yield has been lower than the short end of the curve because of monetary tightening by the Fed. And this is totally consistent because you can see in history that periods of money supply contraction, like tight monetary policy, money supply contraction, and so on, quantitative tightening, they're usually associated with periods of an inverted or very shallow yield curve. And it's interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Uh, it's interesting for me because um, I always look at M2. Like I, um, when yes. I look at money supply, when I look at uh, like, there's this this term always like, oh, the, the Federal Reserves and Central Banks are always printing money. Mm -hmm. But like printing money is not literally printing money. They are always doing something like this. It's not li literally like, oh, we just create money out of thin air. Um, there, there are different me methods to that. Um, but for me, always like M2 was kind of the, the best way to, to track the, the money supply. Uh, what mm -hmm. was the other thing that, that you mentioned? Central bank reserves. I think there's a big difference between those two types of monies. So as you mentioned, so banks create money out of thin air. It's, tr it's academic truth. It's been shown. It's been demonstrated in academia as well. And um, it's not only the central bank that creates money. It's like commercial banks as well. And I, I think the majority, vast majority of money supply 
originates not from the central banking sector, but from the commercial banking sector. Every time a commercial bank um, lends money, gives out a loan, it creates money by a balance sheet expansion. So the active and the passive side are uh, expanded in the balance sheets, and that's how they create money. And uh, similar for the Fed, they buy assets, right? But at the same time, for instance, they buy like treasury bonds or mortgage-backed securities on the asset side. But at the same time, they credit commercial banks' reserves, right, with central bank money. So reserves go up, which is a liability for the central bank, and assets go up at the same time. So their balance sheet expanded. They increased the uh, base money supply, but it, it, they created it out of, out of nothing digitally, right? And we can talk about like, uh, I mean, it's quite obvious, like fiat money has no intrinsic value, right? Um, why, does it, why doesn't it have an intrinsic value? Because, I mean, the marginal cost of production uh, in order to produce a single euro is the same for like 1 billion euro, right? There's no difference. <laughs> they just push a button and it's created digitally, right? Out of thin air. And the big difference to things like Bitcoin and hard assets in general, you need energy to create Bitcoin, for instance, right? The marginal cost of production to produce one Bitcoin is different than producing 10 Bitcoins, right? We know it's at least 10 times uh, bigger, right? The amount of energy that you need. And I think, um, yeah, that's the big difference. But let, let's talk about like the difference between central bank reserves and like broad money supply, like M2. So M2, uh, is a monetary aggregate. It's, it contains liquid and illiquid components, like liquid, like money market funds. They're very liquid. You can trade them. You can easily exchange them for dollars, right? Like or euros. But they're also like more illiquid um, uh, mon monet monetary assets, like um, savings plans, right? Savings accounts. I mean, you have like at least some some kind of maturity, maybe three months or one month, but it's not as liquid as the more liquid components, right? Like checking accounts, super liquid, but they're also part of uh, M2, but they're also illiquid stuff. So this is like commercial bank money. It's different from central bank money because uh, only central banks can create central bank money. They, they are the only ones who can create central bank reserves. And most people don't get this. So there are actually two types of monies. Um, we as, uh, as the public, the wider public, which in also includes corporations and so on, private companies, we don't interact with central bank reserves. You know, We don't touch this kind of money. It's only, it only circulates within the uh, with the interbanking system so between like central banks and commercial banks right and commercial banks need central bank money to fulfill fulfill central bank reserve requirements for instance but like they can't create it they need the central bank for this you know they need uh, central bank reserves how does this change then when uh, central banks directly issue money with like a CBDC? That's that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, the moment we have retail CBDCs, right, we can hold like surrogates of central bank money, right, central bank reserves. This might change, right? And um, many people say, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's somewhat of a risk, right, privacy in pr privacy terms and whatnot. But I think um, the reasons why central bank want to do this is like to have more control over the money supply itself, right? Consumer spending and so on. Uh, and maybe like uh, in case we have like um, a scenario where cash is being abolished, which is not, I mean, the central banks, they keep denying it. Oh, no, we won't like abolish physical cash, we won't abolish banknotes and, and coins, right? Physical coins. 
Uh, but in case we have such such a scenario, I mean, they can introduce whatever kind of monetary policy they like, essentially, right? For for in terms of CBDCs, but like, I think crypto assets might, especially Bitcoin, might uh, be some kind of exit valve, you know, exit door, because. Um, as we know, Bitcoin is immutable, it's censorship resistant, counterparty risk free. Nobody can change the monetary policy of Bitcoin, except you have a consensus, which is very, very unlikely, right? But nobody essentially can change the monetary policy of Bitcoin. You don't get negative interest rates <laughs> when holding Bitcoin, right? It doesn't lose purchasing power over time to the contrary right we know the purchasing power of bitcoin is rising and it's rising significantly against fiat assets right fiat monies especially but also other hard assets like real estate like gold's been rising against these assets so this might provide some kind of exit valve against like cbdc's and it might provide like from a more political more democracy point of view right this might provide some kind of checks and balances yeah for like central banks not to abuse this kind of enlarged power right but this do you think it's discussion. possible do you think it's possible that like central banks have gold right so yes. when 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 they have gold they, they get why they have to hold gold to have some kind of value um do you think it's possible that they at some point say like, oh, uh, this gold is actually not doing a lot. It stays the same measured in US dollars, but when you measure it against Bitcoin, it's like re um, decreasing in value quite rapidly. Um, do you see that it's possible that they at some point print money to, to buy Bitcoin? It's possible. I mean, um, I think the central bank of El Salvador was already doing it. So some central banks are already doing it. Um, but it's like this kind of a sequence of players that it's like these dominoes, you know, that start falling, you know, uh, the concept of social proof is really important with respect to Bitcoin crypto assets in general, because I made the experience, um, that the moment BlackRock fidelity and all the like big, biggest asset ma managers in the world, essentially issued a Bitcoin ETF in the U S there was like this kind of career risks that many traditional asset managers had to invest into digital assets like Bitcoin. It rapidly decreased, right? So the Black Rocks and Fidelities, they actually, actually validated the investment case for like maybe pension funds that are more conservative, right? Maybe the other kind of traditional asset managers that are more conservatives. And these guys, they may validate it for like sovereign wealth funds. And uh, as a result, these guys, the sovereign wealth funds, they start validating it for central banks, right? Because if a sovereign wealth fund like starts buying Bitcoin at some point or any kind of other digital asset, but most likely Bitcoin, right? Then, uh, I mean, it's just a matter of time bef before like central banks themselves start buying it. But they will probably be the very last entities to do so because buying Bitcoin um, implies that they have to sell fiat, right? And so <laughs> they increase, they automatically, mechanically, they will increase selling pressure on their fiat currency, right? When buying Bitcoin. Maybe at some point there will be speculative attacks like, ah, this central bank's not holding enough Bitcoin. So speculators will start selling the fiat currency of that currency, uh, of that country, right? And so they will need to like increase their reserves in Bitcoin at some point. That's some, that's a kind of game theoretic scenario. But I think like career risk, and I, um, I speak with many like clients, asset managers, institutional investors. So career risk has considerably decreased the moment we had these um, Bitcoin ETFs in the US, right? The spot Bitcoin ETF trading launch. And you've seen that like 
out of the top 25 global hedge funds, the biggest hedge funds in the world, you see like at least half have invested according to the latest 13F filings, right? At least half of them. We know universe, like Ivy League university endowments have invested, right? Stanford and others like... Uh, we also know like, like state pension funds, Wisconsin, they have invested, right? It's already like if a state pension funds like, uh, like Wisconsin starts to invest, it also validates the case for other state pension funds because they might say, oh, look, Wisconsin, they've invested. Why don't, don't we invest, right? And my, my thesis is, so these dominoes start falling. And my thesis is it used to be a career risk to invest into Bitcoin, right? And other crypto assets in general. It used to be a career risk, but at some point, this will change. It will flip-flop, you know? So it will be a career risk not to invest because, like, um, we all know that, like, plenty of studies, like, multi-asset portfolio studies that show if you only invest like a tiny proportion of your portfolio into Bitcoin, right? Uh, even 1%, you significantly outperform. Okay. You increase your sharp ratio, so risk-adjusted return goes up and your portfolio volatility only increases marginally. So you more than compensated for the risk, right? In terms of returns, you more than compensated. Sharp ratio goes up. And even max drawdowns, they only increase very, very marginally. So you can easily beat your benchmark as a multi-asset portfolio manager, right? By including Bitcoin crypto assets in general. But Bitcoin, we have most of the history for Bitcoin, right? There are like plenty of studies already. And so I think um, the ones who will invest in Bitcoin or do invest right now, already they will be the the morning stars and the lippers of tomorrow they will get all these portfolio manager awards right because i mean they've outperformed their benchmark they've outperformed their peers and so the the pressure like from clients the pressure from the industry from the, from the bosses you know for portfolio managers will increase they will say at some point yeah why don't you invest i mean I'll go to these guys that do invest, you know? They bring more return than you do, right? Why don't you invest in Bitcoin, for instance? It doesn't make sense. So this this pressure will increase. And I'd say we're not there yet. I don't think we might be at this like kind of threshold to this kind of scenario, but we're not like there yet. But I'm um, observing this right now, we, we see like first um, asset allocators that start investing, you know, or have already invested. And I think this will be like a snowballing effect will become bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at some point flip-flop and then it will be a career risk not to be invested. And this will like validate the case for other kind of investors and ultimately central banks. Amazing. It's uh, for me, it's like when I look at the ETF and all the things that are happening, like, now there's the Michael Dell debate if, if he is now investing in Bitcoin and, and, and stuff like that. And may, maybe Dell does something with it. And he, is, I think, even sold uh, some mm -hmm. shares, like a lot of that, actually. Uh, and, and I mean, this trend continued since like the beginning, like first, like there were only small nerds in, in, in Bitcoin, the cypherpunks. And then uh, it got to like the collector's item status. Then all of a sudden it actually got a price. It actually got a market. Uh, mm. then we have publicly traded companies in there. We have countries in there. Now we have an ETF, like this, this asset class just like attracts more and more players and it gets bigger and bigger and, and mm. on, on bigger and bigger tables. It's, it's, it's fascinating to, to see that, but the Bitcoin ETF, maybe let's focus a little bit on that. Where are you disappointed from, from the impact it had on, on, on the price? Uh, did you expect more or, or was it always like, it, it needs more time to actually kick in because people stand behind that and they have to make decisions and the decision mm. uh, uh, duration is just longer. So I think the very first trading day you had like 
um, disappointments, but I think in general was, I mean, by far the most successful trading launch ever in the ETF space. I think both BlackRock and Fidelity, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think both BlackRock and Fidelity, they were the very first um, ETFs to reach uh, $10 billion assets under management in the shortest period of time, I think below 100 days. So it was really, really successful, way more successful than the gold ETF launch in 2004. And so by that metric, I think uh, it has blown out expectations. But um, many people said like, ah, uh, don't invest into ETFs, don't invest into Bitcoin because like ETFs are priced in already. Because until um, the 11th of January, before the trading launch, right, the price already kept rallying, right? in anticipation of this kind of trading launch after the approval. And so people said like at 42,000, when the trading launch actually occurred, right? Was uh, the price was at 42,000. People said, ah, it's already priced in, right? But we, we said like in our research pieces, we said like, no, it's not priced in because the moment you see those flows, there will be a price impact. And we saw the price impact already, right? We went from, 42,000 to $73,000, right, in Bitcoin. So it was not completely priced in. We saw those flows. And I think um, since trading launch, US spot Bitcoin ETFs alone, we saw around 14.5 billion, almost 15 billion in net flows only, net inflows into these um, 10 vehicles. So I think it, it blew out expectations and you can see it also in the fact that new all-time highs before halving are unprecedented. <laughs> I mean, we reached new all-time highs and that was like before the halving, before like the 20th of April, we reached $73,000. And that, that was a major course, thing, yeah? Yeah, it's a major thing. Like, And the, uh, the ETF flows, they were the main sort of catalyst. I think like from a macro perspective, if you look at, at it quantitatively, it was more like a general increase in global risk appetite, increasing global growth expectations, and so on, like from a macro perspective. But these flows also contribute to a certain like percentage. Uh, yeah, and it, all -time high, new all-time highs before halving. That's unprecedented. But I still, so that being said, I still don't think that the ETFs are completely priced in now. The reason is that and we all already formulated this kind of investment thesis in December last year. So what we looked at was like how much capital, how much money is actually sitting in passive uh, ETFs in the US alone, but only risky assets. So only equities, commodities, so developed market equities, emerging market equities, commodities. How much is actually in, in invested? And uh, I think back then it was around $7 trillion because the market has gone up. So it's more like $8 trillion now. But so we made this kind of thought experience. So let's assume like 20% of those invested in the US of these ETF investors that hold risky asset ETFs. So only passive stuff, right? They decide to like, oh, okay, let's allocate... 3% of our portfolio, you know, let's switch 3%. So let's switch from these risky assets, 3%, which makes sense. I mean, you can like debate, ah, it's 20%. So every fifth asset manager is that reasonable assumption, right? Is 3% allocation is a reasonable assumption, but like there's evidence that the retail adoption rate in the US is around 20% already. It's between 15 and 20%. Some Surveys say like ah uh, like unchained. They came they came out with surveys says like already uh, already twenty around twenty five percent right. So retail adoption is close to twenty percent, and most of the studies, like the portfolio studies, they imply okay three percent Bitcoin allocation is optimal. You know, it, it maximizes your sharp ratio and so on. Um, so that's. These are the kind of assumptions. So 7 trillion or around 8 trillion now times 
20% times 3%. And we made this calculation, it's very simple, but we made this calculation back in December and it implied around 30 to 40 billion US dollars in potential flows. And we have already seen like 14 to 15 billion, but still it implies we have, haven't even seen like half of these potential flows, you know. We have probably seen only like one third or 40% of potential flows. And, you know, there's the story with these warehouses in US. You mean there are certain distributors, fund distributors. So the whole infrastructure is not completely set up, you know, for perfect distribution. And this will take time, as you mentioned. I mean, um, until we have these kind of distribution channels set up, funds have uh, done their due diligence and so on. This takes time, right? It's at least half a year. And so my hypothesis is still, it's not priced in, right? We will see continuing flows into Bitcoin ETFs. You will probably have the Ethereum ETF launch, I think in July, maybe at the end of summer. I think Baljunas, he revised his latest expectations to like either 8th of July or end of summer. But anyway, so it's probably earlier than expected. And probably have some even Solana ETF launch. Who knows? But like, I think if you like concentrate on Bitcoin right now, it's you haven't probably even seen half of potential inflows. And it's interesting because when we see uh, Bitcoin price movements, usually like in the past cycle movements, and it's no guarantee mm -hmm. that it does the same thing every cycle because the cycles and the halving has less and less impact. But usually like the 18 months after the halving are the best months uh, to be in, in, in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the special situation that right before the halving, Bitcoin ETF, which unlocks a lot of capital, um, uh, is launched. And we even had the all-time high before the halving. Yes. Uh, and then we also have to factor in that most of these ETFs probably take like half a year to a year to really allocate and really get in there. And we already have now um, a quite a, a good amount of flows. Uh, and then another factor is like when the price shoots up, there will be more pressure on those asset allocation, on the asset managers, like, hey, why don't you have Bitcoin? Like this 20% might be coming up to like 40% of the asset manager, like uh, getting into Bitcoin. Maybe mm -hmm. this 3% gets to like 5 6%. <laughs> it's like... the. the if, if you change a little bit of the variables, it, it's, it's, a, it's really quickly uh, uh, a, a, a really big snowball effect that could happen, happen in the next like 18 months. Mm -hmm. Now to my question, what do you think, um, what, what do you think is possible uh, for Bitcoin in the next eight to 18 months? <laughs> Let's start with the halving, right? Because such a huge event. So my hypothesis is, Halving is not priced in, despite the fact that we, we rallied to new all-time highs before the halving. So everyone also said again, again, right? Halving is priced in, <laughs> right? But I think uh, it's not priced in for the following reasons. So we did some research into past halvings. So it goes without saying, there's been huge price appreciations post halving. Right, I think it was 17x 500 days on average, 17x 500 days after the halving. So that includes like the past three halvings before the, the latest one, which is uh, which are 2012, 2016, and 2020. So 17x. Uh, but what's even more important is there's such a huge performance difference between performance post halving and pre halving. So performance, for instance, like 20 days after the halving minus 20 days before the halving, 50 days after the halving, 50 days before the halving and so on. So if you like calculate these performance differences and then you get some kind of yeah, performance difference, it's positive <laughs> most of the time and it's positively skewed towards post halving. So you see significantly higher performance post halving than pre halving. And you can even measure this statistically and you can test it whether it's significant. And uh, 
when you look at the significance, the halving itself doesn't really become significant around yeah, 100 days after the halving. Then it starts to become increasingly significant and then the most significant around 400 days after the halving. It totally makes sense, you know, because at first, I mean, the halving effect is not, it's not much, right? We have like a supply deficit of 450 Bitcoins per day, right? So mine supply was cut in half. It decreased from 900 Bitcoins minus 50% to 450 Bitcoins. So we have like a 450 Bitcoin supply deficit compared to pre-halving, right? And on the very first day, it's like 450 Bitcoins only supply deficit. But on the second day, it's like 900 Bitcoins supply deficit. On the third day, it's 1,350 Bitcoins supply deficit and so on. So it tends to accumulate over time, right? And that's our explanation why you don't see like a huge significance at the beginning. And that's a time lag, you know, of this effect, which takes hold around 100 days after halving and then becomes increasingly significant. And so 100 days after the halving would imply, so we had the halving event on the 20th of April. This would imply that it will become significant around August. So summer, end of summer, it will start like affect the price of Bitcoin. And so when you think like, ah, is it priced in or not priced in? What we also did was like, we built a quantitative model. I mean, disclaimer at this point, yeah, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? It's just a quantitative model, uh, but it only contains the halving effect, right? Uh, but also it considers the fact that the marginal effect of each halving decreases over time. Because, um, I mean, the last halving, we went from 6.25 Bitcoins to 3.125, right? And 3.125 in terms of the current supply in percentage terms is way, way less than like the very first halving where we went from like 50 Bitcoins per 10 minute blocks, right? To 25 Bitcoins. So, and the supply was like less than 10 million coins, right? So percentage wise, the halving effect, the earlier ones, they were way more significant, right? And so, but even if you consider this kind of fact, so halving effect plus the fact that the marginal effect will like, um, will decrease over time. So we found out that the new kind of equilibrium price, according to this model, is around $103,000 by the end of this year and $172,000 by the end of next year. And the funny thing is it now starts to like, it will now be a ta tailwind for the price. It will now start to support the price because uh, in the run-up to the halving, and we just talked about this, right? Uh, we had like new all-time highs before the halving. So we had, we had some kind of decoupling from this equilibrium price, the price was too hot, right? Valuations were somewhat on the expensive side, but now that we had this correction, right, to fifty-eight thousand dollars again, valuations have been have become more attractive. They've been they've been closer to fair value, also according to this model. But we have all other kinds of valuation models that signal the same. So we are more in line with fair value now. And we, yeah, coincidentally, we've touched this point where like this kind of halving effect now becomes a tailwind, you know, and I think it will become like a significant tailwind starting yeah, around August. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is 
is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. And there, there was an, I think, a really in-depth video that I once saw for like, it was like one hour or something like that, who said, who said like the, the Bitcoin price is never really priced in because uh, it's not only about the financial side of things, but also about psychology. <laughs> uh, and mm -hmm. like when everybody accept, everybody expects something, uh, it's like, it's more likely to happen than not. <laughs> Uh, and it's, mm. it will be interesting because as you said, like we have now 92 or 3% of the supply already mined. So there's not a lot of new supply coming anyways. And it, mm. I think was, what was it? 90, uh, 20, 35. I think we have 99% uh, of the supply. Um, was it 20, 30, something around these lines. Yes. And then mm -hmm. we, we only need like 1% and this 1% takes like till 21, 40. So <laughs> the, so the halving mm -hmm. in itself has less and less impact and will have in like 10, 20 years, almost no impact on new supply. It's like, like so small as an impact, but it will be interesting if, if it actually continues. And then we also have like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, models, I think sale is the most popular one for saying all models will break. Like once yes. so, so, so someone big enough comes in, uh, breaks like when, when there's a town turn and in the town turn, Apple decides to convert 20% of their balance sheet to Bitcoin and then all the f uh, fear of missing out and all the, all, mm, all the mm. news like this probably will <laughs> shoot up the price to uh, maybe like five X or depending on where we are. But, uh, like th this is really interesting for me. And on the one side, I'm just hodling. I'm just like hundred percent in Bitcoin anyways. Like I, I really don't care mm. what the price is because I, I adopted a Bitcoin standard, but still it's interesting to think about like, where will we go? And it's for me also interesting because I have a lot of people that watch me on the podcast that are already Bitcoiners and just want to learn more about the asset and want to learn more about uh, from other Bitcoiners. But there's also mm -hmm. always a certain percentage that are curious about Bitcoin and don't have Bitcoin and just like want to check out a few episodes and, and want to see what, what Bitcoin is about. And what I learned when I put price predictions or price things in there, this attracts more <laughs> um, more, more outside of the Bitcoin community. Like if you're really a Bitcoiner, they, they don't care that much about Bitcoin. Even like, even if I put like a price target in the thumbnail, they are like, oh, why did you put like, this is clickbait. Like they're, they're not as, uh, they, do, they, even on the other side, we're like, ah, we don't like this kind of a content, but it attracts new people. It attracts, uh, outside of the Bitcoin public. People are like, oh, this Bitcoin thing is, is still still mm -hmm. there, uh, and it might go up. Like let let's check let's check it out. And so I think we, even as a Bitcoiner, we have an obligation to to talk the normy language, to talk the language outside of our Bitcoin bubble, uh, mm -hmm. and and tell like this is the potential of Bitcoin. Like there we can go, because mm -hmm. most people are like, oh, where can the uh, asset go? And then they they think in like dollar terms. Mm -hmm. A lot of Bitcoin already don't think like that. Most people, most Bitcoin even do it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, where do you see, like when we see like the, the the bigger picture in like 10 years, 50 years, do you have some sort of model? I mean, it's really hard to predict because a lot of things mm -hmm. can happen. But do you have some sort of model where we had, this is the, the Bitcoin price for really long term. This is the Bitcoin price for uh, where, where we see it, uh, going, I think hundred thousand for the end of the year is a really cool and, and really realistic target. I, I feel mm -hmm. like we, we probably overshoot that, uh, but mm -hmm. we can also undershoot it, but it's a, it's a realistic and good target. I feel like, um, but where do you see it long-term, uh, going when we have all those, those strengths that we talked about in the day? I think it's really interesting because like. There's so many variables that influence the price of Bitcoin. I mean, obviously one is scarcity and we just talked about the halving effect. Um, the other one is adoption. But as you said, like normies and like the wider population, they, of course, they look at price. And um, 
The funny thing, and there's lots of research, I think, by the BIS, Bank of International Settlements. They've done some crypto research as well, and they looked at like retail adoption. And it's not like adoption drives price. It's the other way around. Price drives adoption. So the moment you have an increase in performance, increase in like price, but a significant one, of course, people start talking about it, increasing acceleration and adoption. And you can see it in the data as well. If you, they're like global ID verified crypto users, I think the data from uh, crypto.com from the exchange, uh, it really shows that adoption itself is cycling. So you have the highest growth rates in adoption, highest user growth in bull markets and lowest user growth in bear markets. It makes sense, right? And you also have like the most uh, exchange app downloads during bull markets and yeah, the least in bear markets. It's totally normal. And it's, it's just part of human psychology. You know, we desire things that go up in price, <laughs> right? Because some way, in some way it conveys, okay, this is, this is valuable. You know, there's also social proof. Others are valuing this. This is going up. This is interesting. And so you see this increasing adoption. But like in terms of uh, the long-term view, I think many, many people are following this kind of power law model, right? And it, it it's based in like human psychology, adoption cycles, like how do viruses spread, right? Virus spread, spread more like exponentially. Power law is more like, the power law model assumes that growth rates will decrease over time. So it will continue to grow, but like over time, the growth rate will decrease and you have this kind of concave curve, right? That's the power law model. And like you mentioned, um, Michael Saylor, all your models will be destroyed. I mean, for me, this is still a possibility. I'm still in the camp of some kind of like scarcity model, the one I've mentioned having, but also power law model, which perfectly dovetails this kind of model because the the halving effects also decrease over time, right? But I think it's it, it, we shouldn't rule out this kind of extreme scenario of hyper Bitcoinization, right? Because I think when when Mike, guys like Michael Saylor says like, say like ah all your models will be destroyed, right? They implicitly mean hyper Bitcoinization, right? So uh, for me, hyper Bitcoinization is. Um, when adoption starts to accelerate like significantly. And I think it's, it's somewhat, it, uh, this kind of probability is not zero. It's definitely higher than zero because like you've probably seen these recent videos of Trump talking about like 50 million crypto users in the US already. And some surveys, I've just seen them, they imply like 90 million users. But I think most of these like surveys, they imply like 50 to 60 million. Some say it's like 40 million adults, right? But in general, I think 50 million is probably a good number. So, and they're like 50 million uh, dogs in the US, <laughs> right? So if you're against crypto and Bitcoin, then it's like you are against dogs right now. <laughs> So That's a nice it's, comparison. It's, you know, it's politically not feasible anymore. It's like political suicide to be against crypto because you lose out on 50 million voters, potentially, right? And I think Trump realized this. He realized, okay, I can gain a majority by advocating Bitcoin mining, crypto in general, like pro-crypto legislation in the US, right? Trump, Trump can, had, a, had a need to know about Bitcoin and he now has to adopt <laughs> it. Yeah, <laughs> He's like, I have to be for it. Otherwise, I, I, I don't get the voters. And uh, so I think why that's important. So um, crypto is influencing the presidential election, right, already. So it implies that adoption rate in the US is already relatively high. So if it already influences the election, must be significantly high right now. And like, like I've said, like most surveys, they imply like yeah, 15 to 20% retail adoption. 
And we know from these models of technological adoption, for instance, the Rogers Bell Curve, very classical model. You have the, the um, innovators, the very first guys who adopt the technology. Then you have uh, like the big early Bitcoin miners, Satoshi, um, Bitcoin mailing, mailing list, and so on. BitcoinTalk.org guys. Then you have the um, the early early adopters, right? Which so innovators plus early adopters is around fifteen percent. So fifteen percent retail adoption is very early still. But then you have this kind of threshold, which is between fifteen percent and then the rest, you know, afterwards. Because that th threshold is a threshold to early majority, and the reason why that's important is. After the early adopters and after the threshold to early majority, you have an acceleration in adoption rate. Like it really starts to take off. And um, I think like the Bitcoin ETF, ETFs in the US, they've, they've, like, they've really accelerated Bitcoin adoption across the United States. And that's my explanation why it's so important for the pre presidential election as well, you know. And, so just... Yeah, I wouldn't rule out that this like that we have some kind of hyper Bitcoinization because we're exactly this threshold, especially in the US, where adoption really starts to take off, starts to accelerate. And then maybe like the halving model that I've just mentioned is will be completely destroyed, right? <laughs> then the power law model, right, will be completely destroyed because they're, mo in my view, they're more like the conservative types of model. They imply like a concave like shape of the price over time. But if we have hyper Bitcoinization, then price really starts to go exponential again. Do you see uh, when we talk about hyper Bitcoinization, I also feel like different people have different uh, imaginations of how, how this look like. How, how does it look for you? Like when, when you talk about hyper Bitcoinization, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Yeah. Mass adoption essentially. So because like if you go on Twitter, you see many people say, like, ah, oh, we're still early. Look at this. We're still early, but I, th I don't think we're that early anymore. You know, my hypothesis is since the Bitcoin ETF trading launch, Adoption has been accelerating, right? And as I've mentioned, it, it's quite usual to see an increased acceleration in adoption rates during bull markets, right? And if this bull market continues, uh, which I expect, you know, we will see even more adoption, more adoption growth. And because we're at this threshold, it's like a, it's like a domino effect, you know? If you have like a certain percentage of the population i think you only need around like 15 or even uh, some theories they only imply like you need 10 percent of the population as kind of influencers and then like mass adoption is almost a given you know so there's some theories that imply this but like uh, like i've said surveys imply like 15 to 20 percent retail adoption usually starts to take off and that's like the point to early majority and the moment you have the all in majority, you have mass adoption because then adoption rate is above 50%. So more than every second American will have Bitcoin or crypto assets. You know? mm. I think what, uh, when, when, when people say we're early, because there's a, like, for me, there's a difference between how many people have Bitcoin mm -hmm. and how many people actually have a lot of Bitcoin. And I'm not talking about <laughs> how many Bitcoin per se they have, but how many percentage of the net worth from them personally is Bitcoin. Because I think that we will reach quite soon the point where a lot of people have some percentage to Bitcoin. Because mm -hmm. when we have ETFs now and, and we even have like, you could make an argument because Tesla has Bitcoin and maybe MicroStrategy is also soon in the S&P 500. Everyone that has the S&P 500 has some exposure to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's not a Bitcoin user in my opinion, but you can make an mm -hmm. argument. It's, it's, it, it's in the Bitcoin market kind of. Um, and so like depending on like w w what's one Bitcoin use, like w w when do you adopt Bitcoin? Is it when you have some exposure to the Bitcoin price or do you have like 10% of your portfolio at least to, to be in Bitcoin 
or you actually uh, are, are you only a actual Bitcoiner who adopted Bitcoin if you have self custody Bitcoin with a harder wallet? Mm -hmm. Because then this is a whole different thing. Uh, um, we, we have studies where they show like only two percent of all Bitcoiners, uh, or it might be actually a crypto study. I think there was a crypto study. All all, all uh, crypto holders. Uh, of them, only 2% of them actually hold a uh, hardware wallet. Uh, so mm -hmm. like uh, most people have it on, on exchange or, or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so like depending on, on, on what we see early, because when we really look at how many people actually understood Bitcoin and how many people actually got Bitcoin, it's a really small amount of, mom, uh, of people. But then again, I don't think most people will ever get Bitcoin, but most people mm. will have Bitcoin. Uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. how many people understand gold or an ETF or whatever, they just buy it because they know mm. intrinsically it has value and, and they need it. Like most, most people never question what is money and never question yes, um, exactly. what, what, what they're doing. So it, it's, it's a really interesting debate for me. Where are we with the adoption? <laughs> Because you, you can make an argument for we have 1% adoption or you can make an argument, oh, we have 20% adoption, depending on what metrics also you're looking at. Um, mm. But uh, I think we are early from a price development, um, but it is massive how far we have already come, especially with the ETF and everything. When mm. We have a country in Bitcoin that's stacking one Bitcoin a day. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, <laughs> that's massive. Like, that's really good. Yes. So, I mean, you're absolutely right, because uh, when I worked at uh, my former, former company in the traditional financial sector, we had a pilot investment in Bitcoin, right? In a Bitcoin ETP. And it was only one pilot investment, but we got these surveys that asked like, ah, are you already invested in digital assets like Bitcoin? And so we ticked yes, right? And that means, okay, adoption rate for this company is yes, right? They adopted Bitcoin. But like we had a pilot investment. It was like a tiny percentage of like the overall company assets, right? That were invested. So it, it totally makes sense what you're saying. At the same time, I don't think like owning a hardware wallet is like a necessary condition to like, or even like getting Bitcoin to be invested or adopt Bitcoin, right? Because like many people, they use planes, right? But most people, I mean, you do somehow somehow understand how it works, but like the very, very basics, but not like the nitty gritty of like how a plane works, right? But still we use a plane, right? And same, I mean, the best example is even fiat money, right? If you ask like, where does money come from? Like, and I think uh, my professor he used to, he used to do these kind of surveys with students, even like economic students. This, this is not like the general population. They're even more like, they're more prone to answer this question correctly, right? <laughs> I mean, at least they're supposed to. But so they asked students, where does money come from? And like the majority said like the government, <laughs> which is wrong, you know, because like the options were government, central bank, commercial banks, and then I don't know, foreign uh, offshore source or anything. And so they said the majority is ticked 90%, around 90% ticked like, ah, it's coming from the government. That's wrong. I mean, the majority, the large majority of money supply is originating from the banking sector, right? The government itself can't print money. And the central bank is not the government. They're independent of the government. <laughs> Right, the ECB is independent, so and so the vast uh, vast majority is coming from the uh, banking sector and especially commercial banks. It's not even the central bank; it's the commercial banks that create the majority of the money supply. And so most people don't understand where does money come from, how does it actually work, right? But still, they use money day to day, and I think will be not. I hope not similarly, but like similar, but. Probably most people who use Bitcoin at some point in time, when we've reached mass adoption, most people probably, at least my prediction, um, they probably won't understand how Bitcoin really, really works, the tech behind it, you know, and so on. Because I think that's the saying, like Bitcoin com combines 
um, the the stuff that people don't know about the banking system with stuff that they don't know about tech, right? <laughs> so it's really a harsh combination of things most people don't understand, right? And, and we so, have this, uh, a really interesting example with email servers. Uh, I, I had a podcast mm -hmm. guest on and, and, and he, he was a little older uh, than me. I think he was like 67 or something like that. So a bit, <laughs> a bit, a bit a lot <laughs> older than me. Um, and he said in the early internet adoption, when emails and, and so on came out uh, and he was really involved in there, mm -hmm. most experts in there actually thought everyone will have run their own email servers, mm -hmm. but they did not, uh, saw the future as we see it now as like 90% of people are at Gmail. Um, I don't know how, yes, exactly. how, how big it's like, but maybe like 99%. I don't know how, how many people are on Gmail, but most people are on Gmail or some centralized servers. Like they're probably like five yes, people, uh, uh, services that most people are on. Uh, and, and there are like these two hearts in, 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 in me that, that the one is the, the rational that, that sees the world and, and, and sees the, the people around me that are even like, I have friends that are hundred percent in Bitcoin and they all ho hold it on exchange, <laughs> even though I tell them the fifth hundredth time to get a hardware wallet and to at least uh, educate themselves on, on that topic to at least get some knowledge about that. Um, and, uh, then. Then I see also like all the surveys and all the statistics that not a lot of hardware wallets and everything. But then there's also this, this, this hard in me where like, I want people to actually not only get the number go up technology, but also the freedom go up technology. Uh, mm -hmm. because when you actually take self custody, you can take advantages like you can, uh, take your Bitcoin over borders without anyone interfering with that. You can do with Bitcoin way more than, than just getting wealthy from it. The, the getting wealthy part is, is the, most important to most people, uh, but having transactions that cannot be stopped, like talk to any mm -hmm. uh, activist group that has ever been stopped with, <laughs> with funds and, 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 and fundraisers and stuff like that. They love Bitcoin because you can set up a lightning or a Bitcoin address. Everyone can fund there and nobody can stop mm -hmm. that from happening. It's really, really hard to stop that from happening. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I always make that extreme example. If you have, if you're at home and a uh, thief comes in there and, and holds like a, a gun to the, uh, to the uh, head of your wife, um, if you have gold in that scenario, he can shoot everyone and then get your gold, no matter if you want it or not. With Bitcoin, even though you probably give it to him, <laughs> and with, with Bitcoin, you have the choice to die and take your Bitcoin with you. That's mm -hmm. an extreme example, but it shows you how great the property rights of Bitcoin are. And I always encourage everyone to, even if you don't want to hold it yourself, even if you like, for some reason, can only hold the ETF, even in that scenario, get yourself a hardware wallet for like 50 euros or 100 euros and, mm -hmm. and experiment with that. I did that. Like I, uh, quick start, like I, when I fought three years, that uh, Bitcoin is a scam. And then uh, people challenged me and asked me questions about it. Then I was like, oh shit, I ran out of arguments. So I was researching about it. Uh, and in the, on Friday, I thought it's a scam. On Sunday, I thought, oh, okay, it might be something. Uh, but I, I, didn't, I did not fully understand it. I only was like, oh, okay, it might be more than a scam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on a Monday, I bought, uh, uh, made, uh, opened the Coinbase account on a Tuesday, even though I was not sure if Bitcoin is anything, I bought a ledger because I wanted to got to know the technology. So like, even if you have, um, uh, and, and if you're an, 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 a 60 year old guy who has mm. uh, a million in, in Bitcoin ETF, because, uh, you're rich and you accomplish a lot in your life and you don't want to deal with technology, like take out the day, buy a bit box and, and try out what, what's possible with the technology, like just to uh, enhance your, your, your knowledge about the technology. Uh, like this is uh, what I also always try to, to get, but I think most people won't. <laughs> most <laughs> people okay. won't, yeah. It's fine. I mean, uh, there are different solutions um, and I mean, providers right like us i mean etc group um we have the bit, biggest bitcoin etp in europe so there are always pros and cons right 
like hardcore Bitcoin maxis, they will say, oh, don't invest in a Bitcoin ETP. It's easier for retail investors, right? I mean, you get a hardware wallet, you you take your coins off exchange, you store in a hardware wallet, maybe you uh, you memorize your seed phrase, right? And then you, if you die, you take the Bitcoins with you, right? But like for institutional investors, it's not that easy, right? Like key management, you, th there's always a risk, right? Pros and cons. So of course, uh, if you do self-custody, um, the pro is censorship resistant, counterparty risk-free, right? You don't have the service provider, the fund and ad administrator, custodian, whatever, but you have, you have risk of uh, losing your keys, right? <laughs> or getting robbed or whatever. Yeah. And for institutions, this is a real risk. They don't want to like... They don't want to do key management. They they want us, you know, to do the custody for them. We use also other service providers who are super professional in terms of key management. But at the same time, we also think like, okay, uh, I mean, we have blockchain tech, but then we have a new layer like an ETP. I mean, it it takes all these advantages from decentralized tech, from counterparty risk-free and censorship resistance and so on. But what, what we do is like the assets are segregated, right? So for instance, our company goes bust. The assets are segregated. They're not part of like the um, bankruptcy, right? And also we what we also do is like we provide proof of holdings. So, I, I mean, what's the case in using, I mean, having this kind of transparency having blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum and you don't provide the public addresses, right? So what we do, and this is uh, others like Bitwise, they also do this, but we, we have been one of the first to do this even before Bitwise. So what we do is like, we provide all the public addresses for all our Bitcoin holdings, you know? And so you can check in real time, are my Bitcoins actually there, right? And so on. So uh, we have an independent administrator that checks all the transactions as well, like third party and so on. So there are like many, many security checks and balances. The funds are segregated. Of course, the, the con is like, okay, you don't have this kind of counterparty risk-free anymore, but at the same time, you don't have lost uh, the risk of losing your keys um, you have very high liquidity and the, sometimes what's funny is the ETPs, the securities based on Bitcoin have sometimes even tighter spreads. So less costs, trading costs than the underlying BTC. <laughs> the reason is that we have market makers, you know, we pay them so they make tight spreads. So if you're trading BTC, which I, I mean, I don't recommend trading BTC. I mean, it makes sense to buy and hold, right? Hodl and so on in the investment case because like there's so many studies do you know this kind of rule of 10 i know so if you lose out on the 10 best days over the past five years you've you've essentially flat on bitcoin because like most of the performance made on like yeah 10 days and so <laughs> it, it's good, good it's, luck finding them yes exactly it makes more sense to buy and hold, like hodl, right, long term, than to try and trade the market, right? Like, mm. like, like we said before, like before the we we started the podcast, the the time in the market is more important than timing the market, essentially, right? And so, um, yeah. Also, less Plus, headache. Uh, by the way, uh, this is really a really important feature. So I talked about the ETP, but what we also do is like, so in case we have a client, a retail client who says like, ah, I want to have the real coins, like give me the real coins because the shares, they're like a claim on the, the underlying coins because it's 100% collateralized. So a client can come to us and say like, ah, I want to have delivery of the, of the underlying Bitcoin. And so we, we deliver them a kind of hardware wallet. And so they get the, the coins like physically in a hardware wallet, you know, that's also possible. 
That's really cool. Uh, I love that. Is that also with the American ETFs? Uh, you know that? I don't know whether they have delivery option. And they're not all European ETPs offer this kind of delivery option. But we do this because of certain tax advantages in Germany as well, because uh, you have a better, more beneficial tax advantage, tax treatment in Germany. And it's also like, it's more, creates more trust because, I mean, then you can always like get your underlying Bitcoin. Especially with the, uh, when, when you publicize your addresses then everyone can say okay at least that much bitcoin you actually have like when you when mm -hmm. you have like you, you might have more that you don't publicize but probably not but uh, at least that that many bitcoin are there uh and and this is uh this is great that nothing like an mm -hmm. ftx thing happens where they have like what did they have two bitcoin or something like that in their reserve uh, and the, the rest was mm -hmm. uh <laughs> love and air <laughs> I think that's what uh, started this whole thing about like proof of holdings, proof of reserves, right? That that's when like Binance also started at some point to like publish their proof of holdings and so on. I mean, most on-chain data providers, they um, they look at the data, they try to like segregate, tag them, tag exchange wallets, and then aggregate like exchange balances, for instance, Bitcoin exchange balances on Coinbase. Bitcoin exchange balances on Binance and so on. So, I mean, you don't need the exchanges to tell you that, you know, that the proof of holdings, because you have CryptoQuant, Glassnode and so on, Nansen, they all do this kind of exchange wallet tagging. And so you can track them if you have these data providers. But of course, like for the wider public that don't subscribe to these data providers, it's probably a good thing. Yeah. Amazing. Perfect. Then uh, I already saw that we are already off over the one hour mark uh, and we have an end routine in the podcast that uh, is two questions. The one question is always the same and the other one question comes from the previous guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, let's start <laughs> with the question that is for everyone the same. Um, it's, it's a question that I ask because I think Bitcoin are unique people and we can learn from each other outside of what money is, <laughs> outside of the things we, we talk about at length in the podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question is, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? What are you doing outside of the Bitcoin crypto finance uh, space? So I'm passionate about my family. I have two sons. One is one year old and my eldest son is five years old. So real, still small, but yeah, passionate about family, spending time with my family. Traveling is also good, but I'm probably more passionate about uh, reading books and playing drums. Because I used to play uh, drums in a band as well. Not so much anymore, but like I still, yeah, go down to the basement. We have, we have a drum kit in the basement, and so I play drums. What what is the most important book that uh, you you can recommend to to people? What they definitely should should read outside of of Bitcoin. <laughs> I think if you're interested in like central bank policy, monetary policy, like money in general, then you should definitely read Princess of the End by Richard Werner. Oh yes, uh, <laughs> someone sent me this on a DM. I think like two days ago. He's like, hey, you have to. The, who, you have who's to the offer? <laughs> yeah, who's the offer? I think he wants to. Richard So uh, he yeah. used to be my uh, PhD supervisor in Southampton. He used to be my PhD supervisor for six years. So I know him very well. He, I think he lives in Switzerland right now, but I'm not sure. He's traveling, traveling a lot. But yeah, he's professor of monetary economics. And yeah. And he spends, I think, more than a decade in Japan. Also, I think he was visiting scholar at the Bank of Japan, Ministry of Finance in Japan. And that's when he actually, like, witnessed the, it was probably the biggest, like, bubble, asset price inflation bubble in the history of mankind, right? In uh, the Japanese real estate bubble in the 1980s, right? And so after that bubble burst, he was around in the 90s. So he, he witnessed this kind of depression, the lost decade, or it wasn't even two lost decades in Japan firsthand. And that's why he, I think that's how he developed this kind of 
idea to write this book. Yeah, but definitely. I don't want to spoil anyone. I don't want to say too much, you know. <laughs> yeah, it it's, uh, came up the second time this week. I have to research now. <laughs> uh, perfect. Then uh, let's uh, let's do this uh, end routine of of uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And this question for you is. How much will a small house in Monaco cost measured in Bitcoin in 10 years? Um, we talked about a lot with the last guest, like how real estate is, um, because the last guest was actually the opinion that real estate uh, does not compete with Bitcoin, but he changed that opinion in the last like six to eight months. Uh, and he's now seeing a lot of uh, even real estate people that are like, oh, I also want to have Bitcoin and Bitcoin kind of sucks up that financial mm -hmm. energy. And we have already this kind of, slow progression the last five years where or five, like, at least like when, when Bitcoin started that real estate is getting cheaper and cheaper measured in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And right now I saw is like the average price in Monaco for a house or for a condo is like 32 uh, Bitcoin. Um, uh, how uh, much is it in fiat? Like, Oh wait, uh, let's, let's, <laughs> 42 let, Bitcoin. <laughs> let's, let's, let's see what the fear price is. Uh, 32 Bitcoin so, uh, are, uh, 2 million. Two, uh, I've heard so it, there's some, yeah, uh, small yeah, house in is probably more like 5 million, but. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, but let's say 2 million, right? Yeah. Let's say that. I'd say. In 10 years' time, I'd say two Bitcoin. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> then, then many more can so, live in Monaco. <laughs> I think it's quite likely. So the reason is, if you look at different models, so I think in 10 years' time, so by the time we are in 2034, I think at the beginning of next decade, so at the beginning of the 2030s, we'll probably already hit 1 million per Bitcoin. So based on Paolo model and all kinds of different models, they imply the same. The funny thing is that if we hit 1 million in terms of uh, price, that implies we hit around 26 uh, trillion, I think, US dollars market cap, right? Yeah, 26, uh, which, is prob which is the current market cap of all US treasuries. And it's significantly higher than all the gold. So if we hit 1 million per coin, that means we have probably disrupted gold as a reserve asset already and are probably on a good path to disrupt US treasuries as well. But of course, I mean, like, because that is growing so much right now, and so you have more and more US treasuries, it will probably probably take more time you know to like really reach the market cap of u.s treasuries but uh, i think there's a good chance that by the beginning of next decade bitcoin will be bitcoin's market cap will be bigger than gold yeah i think we need like six hundred thousand. Yeah, six wrong? or seven hundred thousand because yeah. like more recently the gold price also went up so market cap also went up so Will be will be a, a fun time. <laughs> I, I hope I get Peter Schiff on when when Bitcoin hits that price target. <laughs> but like, yeah, to answer the question, two bitcoins, I think, in Monaco. That's really cool. Uh, two bitcoin, <laughs> uh, I love it. There's a, a side priced in uh, twenty one, and there you can see like real estate prices uh, priced in bitcoin and everything priced in bitcoin, and it's just. Uh, it, it's a cool mind switch when you price things in Bitcoin and no longer mm. in, in, in US dollars. And it makes also expenses, like big expenses and um, investments all of a sudden. You're like, oh, do I really want to spend those Bitcoin? Yes, because exactly. uh, there are only 21 million. Like maybe I never get it back. Yes. Maybe tomorrow is is the week where all the 10 days are in a one row and the Bitcoin <laughs> is at like 300,000. <laughs> like Samson Moore is always tweeting, Omega is coming, right? The Omega, oh, Omega, Omega <laughs> candle. <laughs> Perfect. Then, uh, yeah, thank you, Andre, for, for being on. Uh, where can people uh, reach out to you when they have questions? Where can people find you? So I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, you can see my Twitter handle here, uh, at Andre underscore Dragos. But I'm also, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just type in my name and you go. Just Perfect. feel free to reach out, connect, and yeah. 
as, as they cannot see the screen afterwards, but they can uh, get your Twitter handle from the description. Uh, and I also publish that on, on Twitter so they can just go on the, on the text and I tag you there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, for being on. Thank you for taking the time and for everyone watching and listening. Thank you for being here. And I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Robin. See you.